want to thank the Texas Music Museum, Center for Texas Music History, Women in Jazz Association, and the City of Austin Cultural Arts Division. And this project is supported in part by the Cultural Arts Division, City of Austin okay. Economic Department. So the words rang in true in my ears that he told me, he said, if you want to learn something about this kind of music you like, it, go to Sam Houston in Austin. But little unbeknownst to him, uh, uh, Sam Houston was no longer a university. They, Sam Houston merged with Tillerson College in 1952 and became Houston Tillerson College, which it was at that time. And I graduated from high school in 1958, and I went and did a short stint in the Army. I had to correct them if they had on the internet that I graduated from HT in 59, or I graduated in 50. 60, 60, 61. Oh. No, wait a minute. Yeah, interruption. 62. They said I finished in 61, but I finished in, no, they said I finished in 63. I finished in 62. But at any rate, I was hell-bent on coming to Austin, Texas. Learn something about the style of music that I wanted to play. And when I got here, it was Houston to listen college, so I enrolled in Houston. But that was a plethora of musicians good black musicians here. Matter of fact, Dewey Redmond's daddy was the band director in Bass Rock. I got it. There were a lot of musicians here from Dallas going to school at Tillerson. And I fell right in with them because I didn't know a thing about music. But I learned swiftly and I learned. And to this day, I've never had a piano lesson. Really? Not a private lesson? Oh, not a private lesson. Not private lesson. So I learned from my from my parents, learned from everybody in my family, just by watching and learning. So when I came to Austin, there were a lot of musicians here, so I learned from them. I fell right in with the crowd. And uh, there was a lot of music here in East Austin. Every little nook and cranny, there was some kind of club that had some music in it. And usually it was basically blues or it was jazz. There were a lot of jazz musicians here at the time. Bobby Bradford. That's reason Carmen Bradford. That's Carmen's daddy, yeah. Yeah, Carmen came here because her daddy was going to school. Matter of fact, he was my roommate for a while. Yeah, and I never will forget when Arnett called him and asked him to come join his group. Bobby asked me, should I go, man? I said, man, yes. <laughs> well, what are you thinking about? Go do that. So it was a very rewarding experience for me to be able to come here and fall right in with the musicians here in Austin. There were a lot of clubs, black clubs in Austin. Did you know the entire, from Congress down to, which is now I-35, the all black club? Sixth Street? Yeah. Wow. You could heard that, right? But <clears throat> soon after I got here, it had become uh, integrated with clubs. They moved to black clubs. When I came to Austin, there was no such thing as I-35. It was East Avenue. Yes. <laughs> so, but I fell right in with the guys, and the uh, way we learned was not from uh, music that they was teaching us at his Houston Tillerson, because the, the director of music wouldn't let us play jazz on campus. I heard about Joyce not letting you. That, they can't even G. Williams. <laughs> we would be trying to play music, jazz music in the music building, and he would run us out of that. Get out of here with that noise. <laughs> But he wouldn't let us play, so. But there was a club up on the 12th Street and Pecan called the Flamingo Club, which was run by a man by the name of Willie Jones. We called him Dad, it was his nickname, Dad Jones. And he would allow Wednesday night to be college night for college jazz musicians. And we would go up there every Wednesday night and have a jam session. And he would have jam sessions on Sunday. This went on for years. And this was a, a way for us to have an outlet to learn some of the things that we learned about jazz music, which we learned by rote, because they were not, they were, they were not listening to other records. Yeah, by rote, by listening to other records. Uh, that's what we learned. We put a stack of records on our arm and go to somebody's house, play the records, and say, hey man, what kind of chord was that he was playing there? What was he doing there? What was it? And we dissected like that. And that's the way I learned how to play music here in Austin. 
and there were a lot of clubs that promoted jazz in East Austin. Not so much the rest of Austin, but in East Austin there were a lot of clubs. And so we did have a chance to at least play and play something we learned. Uh, one thing comes to mind at Dad Jones' Flamingo Club. I remember Spell About Starlight was a very popular tune. And so uh, I had practiced Spell About Starlight on campus, learned Spell About Starlight as a ballad. Ah. So I went to the jam session that they had on Wednesday night. No, on, on Sunday night. Because that was at the older guys. It was college night was Wednesday night. Sunday night it was regular jam session. I went up there and asked the guys, I said, can I sit in and play? So I can't remember who was on this. It was older guys. One guy said, hey, little brother wants to play, y'all. Should we let him play? The other guy said, yeah, let him play. He said, what do you want to play, little brother? I said, Stella by Stella. I thought I was cool because I had practice. <laughs> yeah. He said, Stella by Stella. He said, you want to play Stella by Stella? I said, yeah. And I had practiced it as a ballad. He said, little brother wants to play Stella by Stella. Yeah, all the musicians on stage say, okay. Say, here we go. Still about start like one, two, one, two, three, four. <laughs> <laughs> I was swinging. That yeah. wasn't the ballad. I learned it how to play the ballad. So I was, I was totally lost. So he told me, I thought you knew Still about Starlight. I said, did. I do, but I played at the ballad. He said, well, I tell you what. So you learn how to play it up tempo, and you come back and <laughs> I went back to the campus and I got me a metronome. I learned to tell about Starlight. I, if you said speed 200, let's play. I was ready. I was ready. So it was a couple of weeks, about two or three weeks before I went back to the session. <laughs> so I went back to the jam session and asked the guy, I said, can I sit in? He said, yeah, you can sit in. What do you want to play? He said, you want to play Stella by Starlight? I said, yeah, I want to play Stella by Starlight. <laughs> Stella by Starlight was, was, was key, in the key of B flat. So he said, little brother wants to play Stella by Starlight. He said, you want to play it as a ballad? I said, let's play it as a ballad. He said, okay, Stella by Starlight, guys, in E flat. <laughs> uh-huh. And you're a big lesson from that? <laughs> he said, little brother, if you want to learn it, go learn it in all 12 keys. I said, oh, my goodness. It was a valuable lesson. That was so from that, you know, I, I, I never had a piano lesson in my life. But whatever I practiced, I would try to practice in all drugs. Because uh, I knew that I would run in, into somebody like him again down the line. So that was a valuable lesson. And uh, it stuck with me throughout the years that I played music. Make way, musicians. Let's learn all of our keys and in different keys. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Different keys and different I love Well, that, that, that holds true, if you, especially if you want to play behind piano players, if you want to play behind vocalists. All vocalists don't sing in the same key. Well, who taught you how to play behind vocalists? Because you are a great accomplice. Well, they had, uh, they had some vocalists on campus when I got the HT. And uh, they had one particular, I can't remember Jean's last name, but she was a very fine vocalist. They had a lot of female vocalists on HT's campus which I would practice with them and learn songs with them. I wasn't a vocalist per se myself, but I would learn with them. And I had to learn them in various keys with them because they all didn't sing in the same the key. Keys. <laughs> they didn't know what key they sang in. Well, how do you know how to wait for them and anticipate them and kind of mature them? Well, that's something that's, that's not really taught. That's right. kind of innate. You have to... Especially if you're a keyboard piano player, you have to listen to what's going on. Listen to what the vocalist do. See, a lot of, a lot of piano players don't, don't know that you are there to support vocalists. You know, you're not there to shine your own light on yourself. You are there to help vocalists. <laughs> Whoever the vocalist is, you're there to support them. And that's the, that was the key to it. I tried to learn at an early age that to support whatever the vocalist did. They want to do it slow, however they want to do it, and to be attentive to them. Keep your ears open to what they are doing. Well, I've noticed uh, with me and with some other vocalists, you pushed us beyond our capability, and right, you know, putting us on the spot. <laughs> I remember uh, 
one time, uh, well, it happened to me a lot, but Karma Stewart was singing at a Women in Jazz one day, the, the younger Karma Stewart, and uh, she was singing All of Me, and she was doing her ending and doing her tag. She said, why not take all of, and you went, so she had to go, me, why not take all, one more. <laughs> so how do you know we're going to follow you when you, uh, when well, you push us that? It's like, do something different. Do, get out of your comfort zone, and really, you that, know, that, that's, that's how you learn. That, see, it's, it's, it's also up to the pianist or the keyboard player push the vocal. Uh -huh. To help them because nine, lot, nine out of ten of them would, would would like to take the easy way out. Yeah. So you have to push them. You can do it. You can do it a little further. You can do this a little bit different. You know. Yeah. So good. I learned that. So how has Austin? We talked about how Austin has taught you. What do you think uh, you've left to Austin? What what have I left? The greatest influence you think you've left to Austin music scene. The Austin music is that I, I'm not really aware of it, but they tell me that I've influenced a lot of musicians. Oh yes, yeah. That's the legacy that I would like to leave, and the, the other legacy is that I've always been honest about the music. To me, to me, music brings out the honesty in a person. Music is honest. Yes. It's not something that's just made up out of the clear blue. Even though you create uh, uh, lines and. and musical lines. Uh, my theory about that is that music runs in the cosmos. That's what I used to tell my students at, at uh, Texas State. All musicians have what you call an extension cord. And the cosmos is running with music all the time out in the cosmos. It's up to you to plug wow. into it. Oh, you got to plug into it. Well, think about that now. You can have somebody plug. to write a piece of music on this end of the United States uh -huh. and somebody right on the other end of the United States, they don't even know each other. But that song sounds alike. How is that oh, possible? Oh, that's true. So how is that possible? And you have this all the time that people are suing other musicians because they're claiming that that person stole my song. Well, they didn't steal right. your song. <laughs> they heard right. it the same time you did. Exactly. That's what I used to tell my students that uh, music runs in the cosmos and all musicians equipped with extension cords. Except you whether you want to plug in the cosmos uh, or not. I know that uh, some of the musicians you've taught at Texas State University and just playing with, um, they are outstanding musicians and I've worked with them. I've worked with uh, Frederick Sanders and Oliver Jones and uh, Edwin Livingston and all of them today are very accomplished. In fact, come to think of it, I saw Edwin Livingston playing the bass on Ray movie Ray. Did Ray. He played no, uh, no, in the no. movie with Jamie Foxx. He's playing playing bass. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, he is. Ray was playing Ray was singing? Yeah. Well, Ed, yeah. when Edwin, mm -hmm. uh, he didn't, I don't think he graduated from uh, uh, Texas State. He, he came left. through there though, right? He came mm -hmm. through there while I was there. And he left and moved to California, which I think he's still out there. As a matter of fact, I talked to Fred Sanders a couple of weeks ago. He did? He called me. Oh, yeah. he's wonderful. Yeah. He's uh, into theological music. Yeah, he's, he jazzed it up, though. Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's, he's teaching jazz now. Uh huh. Yeah, North of Dallas. I can't remember where he said, but yes, doing good. All right. So uh, we talked about Austin being the live music capital of the world. Um, you know, every city has its slogan, and that's one for Austin. And there's a lot of music here, but um, how do you feel the jazz scene is today? Um, uh, let's just pretend that COVID, pre-COVID, let's say, uh, jazz scene and its treatment of musicians and uh, where jazz is going in Austin. Well, jazz, well, that goes back to where jazz started. Jazz started back in the uh, 1600s, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, and it started from, from uh, field hollows. Gospel music. Jazz is an offshoot of gospel blues. And from the blues came jazz. And uh, jazz has always comprised, now I, I, I get these two mixed up, one fourth percent, ten percent of the music market, or either it's ten percent or one fourth of the music. <laughs> one or the other. I can't remember which one it is. But it has never been 
a very popular music because it involves understanding what the structure of music is, understanding the chordal structure, understanding the melodic structure of music, and being able to improvise. The key word in jazz is the improvisation, and that's making up your own melodies in your head according to whatever the chord patterns are, the chord changes are, to music. And jazz musicians have been able to do that since day one, because in the early stages of jazz, jazz musicians weren't taught. Right. Basically, jazz was created by black people. And black people couldn't go to school. They wouldn't let you go to school. That's right. So they learned that on their own. And they learned how to improvise over what the chord structure was. And don't ask me how they did it, but I did it too. <laughs> <laughs> Innately. Uh -huh. Initially, I did it. But then... That was the beginnings of jazz, and it became very popular in the early 1900s and uh, 1920s, 1930s, when they had the era of the big band. Big bands, they had big bands. So that's how jazz got started, and it primarily got started by black people. Okay, what nobody else tells you, that's how it started. And what about the, uh, uh, say it's uh, December of 2019, what is the Austin jazz scene like? December 2019. 2020. 2020? Is it December? No, 2019, yeah. <laughs> 2019. Last December. <laughs> okay, this past December. Okay. Uh, this past December, the jazz scene, are you talking about the jazz scene in, in yes. Austin, Texas? Well, to me, that's only somebody I have reference and reference what was going on in 2019. A lot of the jazz clubs, per se, had closed down, especially the clubs in, in East Austin. The jazz clubs in East Austin had closed down. There were a few clubs in Austin on the west side of town that were still open. Uh, Chris Kamura had opened Parker's. Yes. Yes, and I think Sullivan's had closed down. Yes, Sullivan's was closed. And uh, that was a club up the street from Sullivan's. I can't remember. A couple of jazz clubs. That was some. Well, most of the. I'll put it this way. Most of the jazz clubs in Austin had closed down. There were just only a few. Uh, they had the gallery, which is above Connell Club, still went on, and the coronavirus closed it down. The Elephant Room? The Elephant Room opened in 1988 or 89. 89, I believe it was. <coughs> and, <coughs> excuse, excuse me, coronavirus closed it down, and it has done most of the clubs. So jazz musicians are struggling right now at this point in time because of the coronavirus. I played, I haven't played, I did a thing with uh, Colin, Colin Shook. Yeah, with the uh, Austin Jazz Society. Austin Jazz Society. Yes, they have that. A couple uh, weeks ago. That was the first time I played since February. Oh. So, jazz musicians are uh, catching the negative brunt of what's going on, as yes, most they, people are. Yes, and uh, I know the Austin Jazz Society has a fund uh, for them. What is that fund called that the Jazz Society has kept? <laughs> I, I thought that's what it was. It, it. Yeah, it's a, I forgot the name of it. But anyway, when you donate to the Austin Jazz Society, uh -huh. they are um, helping musicians kind of survive uh, this time by giving them some fun. So that's one thing. And um, we are hiring as many as we can um, with Women in Jazz on Sundays to keep uh, them going. And we appreciate the Texas Music Office for giving us musicians today <laughs> this opportunity. Well, I, I happen to be old enough to have missed a whole lot of the downfall of what is happening with the coronavirus because I retired from Texas State in 2006. I retired from teaching. And so consequently, the only thing that I had to bring in 
revenue into my household, my retirement checks, and the checks that I got from money that I got from farming music, which ended in the past February. So I'm still getting my checks, and I played long enough to be getting a pension check from the American Federation Ooh, position. Wonderful. Really? It's not that much. But it's a pension. It's a pension check. All right. And I have to thank Ray Charles for not paying into it for us. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well. It's, it's other, other sources that I played that they've taken out. Okay. Because when I, I was, we would play nine-month tours with Ray Charles. We were off for three months. And when we were off for three months, we went and collected unemployment. Yes. So I went to the union, Local 47 in Los Angeles, and asked them, I said, can I apply for pension? Because I was out on the road with Ray Charles on employment. You see, Ray Charles doesn't pay into the pension. Uh oh. He didn't pay into the oh, pension. Oh, no. Well, the only way I get a, a little check from Ray Charles once every five or six months. For all the royalties? For all the royalties that I've done. Well, I was looking up your discography and uh, you have joined a range for a lot of musicians, including uh, Ray Charles, who uh, was nominated for a Grammy for a couple of them, yeah. those songs. By the way, I was looking at the discography under you and I didn't see Pamela Hart on <laughs> and I come in, and you help me with my album, but so I have to do something about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so we have been having a conversation with Dr. James Polk. Thanks to Clay Shorkin. and I also want to shout out to Jason Mellard for helping arrange this today. I um, want to thank the Texas Music Museum, Center for Texas Music History, Women and Jazz Association, and the City of Austin Cultural Arts Division. And this project is supported in part by the Cultural Arts Division, City of Austin Economic Department. We've been here with Dr. James Polk, just having a casual hangout conversation. And he has <laughs> been so nice to uh, share his life experiences with us. And we're just going to give him the last say before he drops the mic on anything else he wants to say to you, Austin. Well, Austin, Austin has been, who's it, has been very, very good to me since I got here in 1959. It paved the road for me to do what I want to do for my rest of my life. There are very few people on this earth can say that they have done all their lives what they enjoy doing. And I am one of the fortunate ones because music has been my life as long as I can remember. My mother was a musician, my father was a musician, my aunt was a musician, my sister played piano, and everything so I got it I didn't have any choice when I came on this earth that I was going to be a musician and I have enjoyed every moment every minute of it and I'm still doing it I just turned 80 years old and I am still doing it whenever somebody calls me and I can so thank you thanks everybody for allowing me to be who I am and I am about music I still sit at home write music as a matter of fact, I have Evelyn Flowers Cook, who is helping me to get my book copyrighted. I have over 55 songs, and this would be my third book that I have right. of songs copyrighted. Can't wait. I have a sextet group centerpiece. In that yes. book, I have over 680 songs. Oh. In that book alone, just that book alone. So I do this every day. So Ray Charles used to tell me one of his pet peeves was that. If you enjoy something, if you enjoy doing something, do a little bit of it every day. He said, if you don't write but two bars of music, do it every day. And I took that to heart. So I do it every day, every day. So I got to get home now where I can write my two bars of music. <laughs> All right. Well, we want to thank Dr. James Polk, and that's a great takeaway. And the last takeaway is a quote that you all should remember from James Polk about music. Don't forsake the group. <laughs> I just finished the song <laughs> that I named Don't Forsake the Group. You did? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll always remember that. And whenever someone's <laughs> going to do their own thing and getting off the groove beat, I always remember he stopping one day 
and turned around to the bass player and said, man, don't forsake the room. <laughs> I'll never forget. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Been thank watching you. a conversation with Pamela Harding, James Pope. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Pam. Pam. Thanks, everybody.